Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Luigi, it's a pleasure to finally be able to speak with you. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? So, first of all, thanks for inviting me, Robby. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm Luigi Latasciano, an Italian archaeologist and uh, anthropologist. Uh, I study dreams in antiquity and uh, different uses of dreams and visions in antiquity, from uh, oracular uh, functions to therapeutic functions. Uh, and I wrote a book which was the result of my PhD research on uh, how dreams and rituals involving dreams and visions evolved from the archaic age in uh, Mediterranean, in Greek and Roman Mediterranean until late antiquity, that is until the first, uh, the early Christians uh, communities uh, in the 5th century AD. Can you take me into how you got interested into dreams in the first place? Yeah, uh, I was uh, 15 years old and I read this uh, <laughs> book that uh, probably is, uh, is uh, well known to many different people, uh, uh, The Teachings of Don Juan from uh, the uh, uh, anthropologist Carlos Castaneda. Uh, the book is about briefly uh, this, uh, this academic anthropologist trying to study the effects of peyote and different uh, and different plants used the uh, psycho psycho psychoactive plants used by um, Mesoamerican Indians uh, and find and looking for a shaman to introduce him to to these plants. He finally finds one, but uh, the things don't, don't go uh, as he expected because uh, instead of uh, focusing on plants, this shaman offers him uh, an entire uh, uh, an entire trip into shaman knowledge uh, and not only on, uh, on plants and among this uh, among the means of uh, accessing knowledge that the, this shaman don juan proposes to carlos castaneda is dreaming or how we call it today lucid dreaming so this was my first um, my first uh, uh, approach and uh, interest in uh, in dreams and what actually we can do with dreams beside then experiencing uh, beside uh, beside experiencing them and uh, and then in my uh, student and then uh, researcher career i i fell on uh, these uh, rituals of uh, incubation as they are called that is ancient rituals of people use, using dreams for therapeutic uh, for therapeutic means so for example ancient uh, worshiper for uh, uh, going to a sanctuary and falling asleep in order to see a vision, a dream vision of the God in order to receive a therapy or a prescription for a therapy. So when it comes to the history, I mean, this had always been just for therapeutic purposes. It seems like with dreams, it's always trying to alter your state of, I wouldn't say state of being, but I mean, dreams are beneficial on so many aspects not only do people get cranky when they don't sleep but when you're able to have a dream sometimes a dream can be a message and usually that's what people take away now i know there's like this rise and i would say not new age psychic culture but there's a lot of people that feel like their dreams are messaging them something and you know if you keep a dream journal it might help you remember some things like uh, they usually have deep meanings or something like if you're drowning in an ocean of sharks it could be you're being overwhelmed by problems and it's just like, where did this culture whole start at? When did it become this aspect in history of using our dreams to give us this message or some type of, I wouldn't say altered state of consciousness, but be able to expand our minds and change ourselves a little bit further? That's an amazing question, Rob. So uh, I, would, uh, I would like to, to clarify one point on this. Probably uh, human cultures use dreams as a way of getting messages as a way of uh, uh, getting better, getting a physical uh, or spiritual healing, as a way of research <clears throat> since prehistoric ages. I mean, there is no culture that, uh, human culture, that uh, hasn't given uh, uh, a huge role to dreams in, uh, 
in in their community uh, in their community aspects what sound the reason why this sounds so strange to us is that uh, our uh, western culture has developed uh, as uh, as uh, uh, is neatly divided. So our Western culture is neatly divided. Uh, what is uh, what is uh, what is dream from what is reality? Whereas ancient cultures and many contemporary cultures, they don't give a, a separated status to what is happening to waking reality and what is happening in dreaming. They are both part of the of the reality. And this is uh, this is the main uh, the, the main difference in uh, in ancient cultures. Dreams were used, and there were techniques, and there were, and people were learning techniques to use dreams uh, for uh, for any kind of aspect. So to interpret messages from the invisible, let's call it invisible, so that we don't have to specify which god or which uh, saint or uh, which kind of invisible uh, actor is interacting with us. There is always an invisible that uh, that is the opposite of the visible. Uh, all these cultures they use uh, dreams and they used and they use dreams to interpret messages to um, for a, for, a, for a bunch of functions, whereas our culture is neatly divided. And so uh, now we use dreams uh, as a um, in psychotherapy. So we 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 kindly restored a way of using dreams, but always through specialists. That is the psychotherapist to interpret our dreaming. This is uh, this is just a part of how dreams can be used in uh, and uh, and uh, the rest uh, the rest is uh, uh, mostly forgotten by by our Western culture. I would say. Where did it start when people started using dreams and thinking it was messages that were being casted towards them? We know, for example, in ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, we have the first uh, records of, uh, of it, but there are also interesting uh, theories interpreting uh, the Paleolithic art, cave art, uh, as, uh, as uh, the, trans the transcription of dreaming. So people dreaming will see things that will later paint in the caves. These are, these are speculations. Let's say that uh, our first sources that uh, can uh, for sure tell us that uh, people used dreaming uh, as a as a way to decode and to interpret messages coming from the invisible we have from ancient mesopotamia so we are talking about uh, 3500 3, years bc before christ and uh, what i have studied in particular are the, um, the dreams in greek uh, in ancient greek culture when i when i refer to greek cultures i uh, i don't refer only to greece as we as we know it today i, I refer to uh, Anatolia, so modern Turkey. I refer to southern Italy, that is the colonized Magna Grecia, uh, and all the and all the part, uh, and all the Mediterranean that came in contact with Greeks. Has it always had a religious meaning to it? Like it seems like the religion culture kind of adopted it more, and it seems like in the area we are today, it just seems like it's more about science, like trying to understand what a lot of our dreams are. You know, altered states of consciousness, using psychedelics to be able to experience altered states of consciousness, lucid dreaming, astral projecting, all these different variations. But it seems like the ritual culture and the more aspect of what our dreams mean and being able to modify your dreams never really had this core message to it. Always sent from a higher power. For instance instance, if someone loses a loved one, they usually end up dreaming about their loved one. And instead of looking at it like how I might, where it'd be like your brain's overcoming loss, this will be like, they're talking to me from the other side. And it's just interesting because you see how like a whole culture kind of evolves around that aspect of things. Yeah. Yeah. And to, and to realize also here, we need another, uh, to clarify another point, because uh, what we what we understand as, as a religion is uh, much, much different from what ancient uh, ancients uh, understood as religion. I mean that, for, for example, for the Greeks, religion was a, a totally a, a, a totalizing, a totalizing experience, and science was developing within what we call what, what we call religion. They were not religious in the sense that we are today. That we understood, that we understand religion today. Religion was all the things that was uh, was for uh, for ancient people, all the things that they, uh, they that they were part of the invisible real, 
So whatever it was, uh, um, uh, an ancient uh, an ancient river uh, could have could have been understood as a god, because uh, the, uh, thanks to the river many communities could prosper, and uh, thanks to the river many communities could uh, uh, could have uh, plants and uh, seeds to to grow to grow their uh, to to develop their agriculture and to, and to and to feed on. At the same time, uh, the river could uh, could be the could be the um, the the weaver of uh, of uh, pestilence to, to to the same community or could represent a threat to the same community so all the aspects that the people could not really interpret were part of uh, the invisible the invisible was uh, uh, given a name and that's how, that's why we call it religion but the invisible was investigated exactly how we investigate the invisible today and that's science so science and religion and magic they are one in uh, in ancient cultures and you know and, and it's not always easy to uh, to um, to understand where one ends and the other and the other begins to make a quick example because here we are we are talking about theory uh, let's go back to ancient greek archaic mediterranean <clears throat> There are a bunch of uh, philosophers, the so-called pre-Socratic philosophers. Uh, one may be familiar with names such as Pythagoras, Empedocles, Parmenides. All these people, they were ancient doctors, they were ancient philosophers, they were ancient poets, and they were what we may call, there is a huge debate in this, but uh, it's not uh, relevant to our discussion, they, are, uh, they, they were what we may understand today as shamans. So these guys were scientists, first of all, because they were studying the invisible, studying nature to understand how to use it to heal people and to prosperate, uh, the, their, to make their communities prosperate in different ways. They were poets because the, um, their culture put in, uh, um, uh, was, uh, was mostly oral uh, at, at this time. And so, um, even the the first of them that wrote wrote in verses which were the 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 way of uh, memorize easily um yeah, memorize and uh, and transmit easily different concepts so even scientific concepts were transmitted in verses and they were also prophets because their use of dreaming and all these people and here it, here we come to dreaming and visions these people developed an uh, uh, a set of techniques to investigate the invisible through dreaming. So they, they through meditation, uh, what we call today lucid dreaming, they were in contact with what they called uh, gods. For example, many of them, they were related to Apollo. Many of them, they were related to Persephone. Persephone is the goddess of the underworld because in Greek culture, the all the all the science all the knowledge all the all the knowledge that is uh, not available to most humans comes from the underworld so in order to get this knowledge you have, you have to get through and to get in contact with persephone so they were using religious concepts but what they were doing was from their point of view not from ours was science i would think that feeling like you're getting a message in the middle of the night you know you hear like i think there's even a theory about da vinci when he came up with the idea for mona lisa was in the middle of the night he decided to start painting and start working on one of these paintings it's finding inspiration it's the message and a lot of the times it seems like a, especially back then everything was kind of related more towards the gods sending you a message if something landed or something went in your favor if it rained it was the gods that did it and i mean it makes sense i mean if you look at plato for instance plato was coming across the very first version of ai you know, what we would talk about AI today was, in his eyes, more of a magical sense, but it was inspiration. And you start to wonder if these cultural roots, the stuff that we are developing today, had any similarity or similarities to things back then. And I mean, we're not, I guess, probably today we're a little bit less religious, more scientific on some aspects. But I wonder who was the first person to actually pioneer dreams? You know, back then, who was the first person to realize this was a source of inspiration? Hopefully he wasn't just sleeping all day trying to dream a lot. <laughs> One, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And by the way, before talking about the first person in, uh, in Greek culture, you made me think about uh, Jimmy Page, for example, of uh, Led Zeppelin. He, he says that uh, he, he, wrote, he dreamed of a stairway to heaven 
<clears throat> first in a dream, he woke up, he, he noted, he took notes about the melody he heard in his dream. And then uh, here we, and then here we go, we have uh, such a masterpiece, a star way to have it. Uh, there are many, many, many examples, uh, even in our contemporary age of uh, dreams as uh, sources of inspiration. The first uh, <clears throat> ancient Greek uh, sage, or uh, yeah, let's call it sage, that I came across in my research that was connected to dream was a guy from Crete, uh, Epimenides was his name, and he was a shepherd. Shepherds are uh, interestingly uh, uh, often connected to dreams and visions and supernatural uh, encounters in, uh, in ancient Greece. So Epimenides, this, this, uh, this guy, this shepherd from Crete, uh, lost one of the goats of his flock and, uh, and, uh, and tried to, trying to, to get it back to the flock, ended up in a cave ended up in a cave, probably a cave dedicated to Zeus, the la later speculation, ancient speculation argues, uh, and felt asleep. He slept for more or less 60 years, 40 or 60 years. Ancient sources are uh, oscillates uh, between the two dates. And uh, during these 60 years of sleep, he encountered the, the, the divine figures, the divine personification of uh, virtue and truth. After speaking and uh, and exchanging with this uh, with this uh, divine personification of uh, of knowledge, after all, he woke up and uh, coming back to his community, he was acknowledged as a divine man. This is the first of uh, what in some uh, in some uh, books are called the ancient Greek shamans. Uh, this is the first that having having been initiated through his, through the sleep and through a dream to the mastery of uh, science and religious art became, first of all, a, a, a prophet. Uh, second of, secondly, uh, a lawgiver, because uh, uh, all the wisdom that he accumulated during his sleep was in the archaic Greek tradition connected to several laws uh, uh, of several different cities. And he was like the other we uh, I mentioned earlier, Pythagoras, Empedocles, and Parmenides. And he was a specialist, uh, a doctor, because in, in his case, he was a specialist in recognizing uh, therapeutic plants. Did anybody come across the idea of what happens when it's a nightmare? What does that mean? If they're, if they're getting so many ideas of what dreams are, what happens when you experience, you know, a not so good one? <laughs> Not so good ones. Yeah, uh, but dreams can take, uh, the, the, the main difference is that uh, the techniques that these people used and uh, the techniques that we still used in uh, lucid dreaming uh, have, uh, have, one, uh, have, uh, have one, uh, one peculiar aspect. You are not uh, ex uh, experiencing a dream. You are mastering, you are the protagonist of your dream. So usually when we dream, Things occur to us. We don't have a uh, we don't have a, a grasp on it. We don't uh, we don't direct. Not not all. We don't uh, we don't always direct the scenario of the dream. When uh, uh, techniques of lucid dreaming of uh, particular dreaming we we may say for these ancient uh, people uh, are used, then you're not uh, then you're not uh, you're not experiencing passively a dream. You are uh, you are the protagonist of it. And that's why uh, that's why uh, uh, nightmares, ephialtis, is in Greek, both in ancient and in modern Greek. The translation of uh, of nightmares, they they fall in the second category of uh, of dreams, those that are experienced passively. However, even those dreams that are that are experienced passively can deliver messages from the gods. And for example, there is a famous, there are famous uh, nightmares. Uh, in uh, in the Odyssey, for example, uh, or or in the Iliad, there is Agamemnon experiencing uh, a nightmare in the Iliad. Uh, there is uh, an interesting, one of the most interesting oracular dreams uh, that is something in between an oracular dream, a nightmare, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, and uh, and a good prophecy is the dream experienced by Penelope, the Penelope, the, the wife of Odysseus. Uh, when she dreams about uh, uh, a storm of uh, birds 
being killed by an eagle. Of course, the eagle is uh, the dream is uh, is uh, is uh, has the characteristics of a nightmare because it's really violent. It delivers the message of the eagle that is Erasmus Odysseus coming back and killing the people that were trying to take his place, the kings that were trying to take his place during his absence in uh, in Ithaca. When did it translate over to being able to find healing purposes with dreams? I know a little bit, like I'm sure the history of dreams probably gets a little bit dark. Um, I don't know why, but the word ritual always seems like it brings a dark undertone to it for me, maybe because of all the cult movies I've seen. But I'm just curious, when did they start realizing it for healing purposes? Like I, I spoke to someone a long time ago about the Salem witch trials and witches using, you know, more healing purposes in that sense. And, you know, eventually it just became a horrible scenario in our history. But it just it's interesting to me to see the evolution of these types of topics. I mean, we use healing uh, with dreams now. We have better probably ways of being able to understand them and different tactics. But it seems like the techniques kind of borderline the same exact thing throughout history. Yes, yes. We can speculate about it. We, we can't give, of course, a clear answer to it, uh, but we can do an interesting uh, speculation about it. Starting from another clar clarification, ritual is uh, given what we have said about religion in antiquity. So religion is not what we, uh, uh, what we understand being religion today. Religion is a set of techniques and knowledge used to communicate with the invisible given the invisible is given different names and, th and that's why it is religion but ritual means technique technique to alterate your state of consciousness to achieve something that you can't normally achieve through an altered an altered state of consciousness so given this what is the speculation we can do we know that these people these ancient uh, uh, doctors first of all first first then be, first the uh, before being philosophers they were doctors more practically for their communities pythagoras epimenides and pedocles parmenides all these people they are the um, uh, they occupy greek history until the 5th century the cult of asclepius the god of med the greek god of medicine that uh, made really widespread the ritual of incubation and the, and that is the ritual and the techniques for dreaming for healing purposes starts in the fifth century so there is a connection between them what can the connection be all these people they use dreaming not for healing purposes specifically but also to develop their medical art uh, and they were transmitting their techniques for dreaming, for lucid dreaming, we, we can say to, to be better understandable uh, to modern audiences, um, they were transmitting the techniques to specific disciples. At some point, these people were uh, related to communities that they are called cities in, in, ancient, uh, in ancient Greek sources, but they were not cities like they later developed during the classical age that is after the from the fifth century from the sixth fifth century bc onwards they were rather small communities so the medical uh, needs of these communities were different from we can imagine now that we live in cities the medical needs of huge uh, populations collected in a small area and uh, in a small in a in a small and greatly urbanized area uh, what is the difference? These people were uh, transmitting their techniques to a few disciples, the first, the first uh, Greek doctors. The cult of Asclepius is born and uh, is directed to uh, an increasing amount of people uh, from the moment that bigger cities start to exist in the Greek Mediterranean. So uh, we can say that we can speculate that the ritual for a specific, uh, a, a specific ritual for uh, healing visions and dreaming um, start to exist when bigger cities start, start to exist and, where, uh, and when um, an increased need for medical assistance and the, the, a different kind of medical as assistance are needed. As a, as a consequence of, uh, of the development of cities. What is the connection, the specific connection between them? <clears throat> Asclepius is the, is a, is a, is the, um, is the ancient Greek god of, of medicine and the patron of doctors. Ancient, uh, ancient Greek doctors, uh, they were not at all, they were uh, 
following the Hippocratic tradition, they were definitely uh, sci uh, scientific, uh, um, developing scientifically their art, but they saw no contradiction with religion. This contradiction is from our point of view, but was never in the ancient Greek point of view. So an ancient Greek doctor would uh, pray to Asclepius and would accept Asclepius uh, as his patron, would uh, even use uh, dreaming to get in contact with Asclepius and to get maybe inspiration for some difficult medical problem he was facing. And at the same time, he would study scientifically the human body and nature in order to perform his art of uh, his, uh, his art, uh, I'm, I'm using art because techne, the ancient, the ancient word for uh, connected to medical uh, to uh, medical skills is the translation of art. So uh, he, he was using his art uh, scientifically without no no seemingly contradiction between uh, between the religious and the scientific aspect. So at some point. Whereas these rituals, these techniques were transmitted only to a few disciples, when the cult of Asclepius started, uh, an easier, a more, an easier uh, uh, set of techniques is, uh, um, how can I say, is uh, crystallized, is, uh, um, is canonized into a ritual that is the ritual of incubation. Uh, accessible to everyone, traveling of, to a sanctuary of Asclepius. So you need you you didn't need anymore to be an initiated follower or a follower of a um, of a doctor in order to access this set of techniques. It was enough to travel to a sanctuary of Asclepius and to start uh, uh, and, and and to be initiated to the as everyone else to the complex set of rituals that at some point would lead you towards the the therapeutic visions so therapy becomes uh, a, spe a specialty uh, in dreams uh, around the 5th century and also it becomes so it, it, it happens it happens to be so because the complex techniques are uh, formulated in an easier way and are uh, crystallized in a ritual that is accessible to everyone. What are some of the complex rituals that they had to go through? So you arrive, uh, what, is the, what is the daily life at the sanctuary of Asclepius, in other words, right? They're, right now they're joining a cult. And like I said, all cults to me are not good ones. <laughs> so yeah, 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 absolutely. So uh, first, you arrive, uh, first, uh, first act to perform as you arrive into a sanctuary, at any sanctuary, especially at the sanctuary of Asclepius. Let's, uh, let's imagine you, are, uh, you have any kind of health problems, you're sick and, uh, and you need to, uh, to meet the God to, to ask for a miracle or for a prescription. First of all, you have to be purificated to purify yourself from all pollution. Purification happens mainly through water which is not a, no, which which means you you wash yourself and purification means not only being symbolically purified in order to enter in the sacred ground of the sanctuary uh, but uh, from a medical point of view means also uh, getting access to water which we have to think was not that accessible that easily accessible as for all of us today wait uh, did they have the fast did they have the fast as well too yeah, yeah. Let me get to it. So first of all, you get you you get purification uh, by, by water, and then you you start a complex act. You have to fast, or and specifically uh, depending on the sanctuary, depending on uh, your uh, your issue, depending on the time of the year, you may have, you may have to fast or to follow a specific diet. In some moments, to avoid any meat. In some moments, to use meat. You have to sacrifice to the god the sacri the, co the communal sacrifice together with imagine all the other people gathering uh, all the other sick, pe sick people gathering and praying at the god. Um, the sacrifice is a very important moment, and uh, prayers, uh, different uh, different prayers, and this repeated for days, days and days. So you will you will you will get uh, purified. You will have doctors checking on you. Um, uh, you will take baths with the uh, hot and cold water. You would um, you would uh, participate in the communal prayers uh, and in sacrifices 
and your expectations about uh, meeting with all the people all together that are there for the same reason uh, reason of you, your expectation for meeting finally in the dream, the God will raise, raise and raise. And you will already enter in a different state of consciousness after spending, say, one week at the sanctuary. Then what I find the most exciting part of all these rituals, because it makes it finally suddenly clear, uh, it's the performance. It's what we call ritual performance. Imagine all people, uh, they, the, the Abaton, the place where people were allowed to sleep, to, to meet the God in a vision, in a, in a dream vision, couldn't toast at the same time all the visitors that were at the sanctuary. That's why some people were staying at the, where uh, the, some people stay at the sanctuary could, uh, could last for months before getting access to, the, to this. During this time, their, their expectation will increase dramatically. Why they would increase dramatically? Because they will see every day uh, someone coming out of the holy chamber where uh, of the that is the abaton. That's uh, that's what it's called, uh, where where you go to sleep and uh, meet the god in your dreams, saying the performing uh, um, the miracle that they received from the god or just telling the vision, or just sharing the vision that they had from the God. Uh, this performance from the fifth century onwards is not only happening from the pilgrims coming out of the Abaton and sharing with all the rest of the people waiting to get their, uh, their vision, uh, their miracle. It was also happening in, the, in proper theaters. From the moment uh, that Asclepius cult start to spread all over Greece, uh, coincides with the moment that theater starts to spread all over Greece from Athens. And the th how theater was used in uh, thera therapeutic rituals and therapeutic sanctuary is really interesting because if, imagine we, I described uh, the, a week at the sanctuary, if this week before getting to the Abbot on the last night of the week uh, to, to meet the God, ends with a dramatic performance at the theater where someone enacts the miracles of the God, the, um, uh, all the um, epic, uh, epic narratives connected to the God and materializes in front of you the images that later on you will try to interact with in your dreams. And then it becomes much easier to dream about it. So kind of like if you rehearse it beforehand, you are more likely to dream about it. Yes. That's that's very interesting because I think everyone's dreams, like I've had segments on this show where I've explained my dreams before. My buddies always like to interpret it or try and, you know, figure out what that is. And I think it's just an understanding. I mean, every dream I can tell you about, and probably everyone has a dream that could easily be a movie or some type of theater performance because it's something that our creativity just goes wild. It seems like it's coming from somewhere else. That's interesting though. I'm wondering what the what the influences of how big dreams were not just in the sense of general populations but i mean a king has a dream before something and then makes a giant movement in history an army general has a dream about a battle that he's about to fight is it considered a message or is it something along these lines yes yes it is totally connected to this because uh, first of all oracular and therapeutic uh, the, the oracular and the therapeutic function uh, you mentioned the king uh, having a dream uh, and then making a big move in history. First of all, then for the for the language that people shared in antiquity and still share today to some extent, uh, giving credit to a dream means to uh, means giving authority to the message you want to then deliver. And let's let's think for example of uh, let's travel uh, uh, in time from Asclepius. Is it like paying tribute, like also putting on a theatrical performance or something like that? It's like paying tribute to hopefully maybe either get a dream or be able to thank whoever might have gave you the message that you are interpreting from your dream? Yes, 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 yes. This was also one of the uses of theatrical performance in, uh, in uh, therapeutic rituals. I'm understanding it slowly, slowly. For example, for, uh, let me give you an example of this, and, and we go back to the to the former question. There is a uh, an ancient point in the fifth century. The we are at the uh, sanctuary of Asclepius in Athens, 
which by no chance is connected to the theater of Dionysus in the, on the, at the southern slope of the Acropolis. So you have the theater of Dionysus and uh, the god of wine. Con yeah, connected to it, connected to it, the small sanctuary of Asclepius. There is this point. Aristarchus. Hang on. Uh, Arist Dionysus is the god of wine and it's somehow linked into dreaming. I just go, of course, because when you drink, it's always, you're usually asleep half the time. <laughs> of course. If you're doing it right. <laughs> so there is this poet, Aristarchus from uh, Tegea. He's, uh, he visits the sanctuary of Asclepius for some uh, illness. We don't know what precisely. He gets healed by Asclepius in a, oh, mm, probably receiving a dream vision. Uh, and Asclepius himself orders him to, um, as a as a votive gift, so as a as a gift for the for the restored health, to write a drama, bear, which bears the name Asclepius. We don't have, unfortunately, this drama, but we know that this drama existed. So not only uh, dramatic performance is used in the ritual to uh, prepare people to meet the god during the during the sleep dramatic performance can only can also be a votive gift a gift for the restored health that you that you create once the you have met the god in uh, in uh, in a vision are you when you're going through this with archaeology are you strictly not only looking at just historical records or accounts that you have but you're also looking from theatrical plays to be also able to base my what had been going on in that time period I am, I am, and there are some, uh, there are some, uh, some examples. Uh, for example, in uh, Aristophanes, uh, he wrote uh, in this in, in his comedy Plutus. It's a, it's a comedy based in a in a sanctuary of Asclepius, and it's a, of course it's a comedy. We it's a, doesn't give specific uh, uh, information to to reconstruct the ritual, but what it tells is, uh, it, but it tells a lot about cultural expectation uh, of that age of uh, the 5th century BC uh, about uh, shared cultural expectation about having a dream vision and, and about the experience at the sanctuary of Asclepius, for example. And there are several ones. There are, there are several that uh, mention uh, um, epiphanies, uh, dream epiphanies, visions, uh, healing visions. Uh, all of these are important. Uh, what, as an archaeologist, uh, uh, is uh, even more important to me is the, to understand the spatial connection between, uh, in this case, theaters and the different spaces where the ritual was taking place. So the place where water was used, where the, where, uh, where, uh, the dreaming was taking place, uh, where the altar was, what is the connection between theater, altar, and Abaton, the chamber where the chamber where uh, people were going to sleep, uh, and what is what is the use uh, uh, what is the use of votive gift? Because as uh, as we said, votive gift can be immaterial, like a dramatic performance offered to the god, but votive votive gifts can also take the the form of uh, uh, parts of the body, like a leg or uh, uh, a pair of uh, eyes or uh, ears or whatever part of the body that probably is the, 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 the part of the body that the person needed to, uh, needed to, to get healed. Uh, reproduction of this offered to the, to, to the sanctuary after people went to, to perform incubation. We go back to what you were talking about before, before I cut you off about a ruler that was given a dream that might have inspired or influenced a certain decision that they would have made. Yes. Uh, for example, uh, Constantinus, the first uh, Christian emperor in the fourth uh, century AD, uh, he, he was involved in, uh, in, a, in a battle for the empire in a, in a, in a war for uh, for taking control of the empire and uh, um it's true it's through one of these dreams that uh, he reestablish his, his authority and establish his authority uh, as uh, uh, as a as a king uh, um, accepted by the invisible by by the gods to in front of his army 
Uh, and there are many, many different uh, examples of this use of uh, this use of dreams. What is important uh, in this case is that oracular dreaming, uh, therapeutic dreaming are connected, are always connected with each other because in the case of Asclepius, now going back to Asclepius, um, uh, we have another dream. Uh, Asclepius was not only healing, he was also giving oracles through dreams. For example, in the third century BC, uh, in this uh, pan of Isilus, it's a steel that, um, that commemorates one of Asclepius' miracles. The miracle consists, it's a healing oracular uh, miracle in the sense that it, it doesn't heal physically a specific person, but it saves a whole community. The community of uh, Epidavros, of Epidavros, where the sanctuary of the, where the main sanctuary of Asclepius, of Asclepius was, uh, and Asclepius appears in a dream to a boy, uh, telling him that he will save the community of Epidavros from the from the Macedonians that were going to attack soon the the, um, the Peloponnese. So in this case, for example, it's an oracular dream. Uh, from the same god of uh, from from uh, from Asclepius, and uh, the connection between oracle and uh, healing is that even uh, even uh, uh, foreseeing how an illness will will finish and uh, what you can do to um, to get better is considered as a prophecy. When it comes to something personally to you that you might have came across in your work that is of interest what's something that you might you know have a fascination about that you really never either you can that you focus completely into or really never focused into talking about uh, dreaming uh, yeah a personal story or experience you don't have to be in your own your own life but i mean something that you came across in your work that you find is a really good historical you know interest to you uh, it's a uh... I, it's uh, frustrating and fascinating at the same time because uh, we try to. That's a good answer. To, That's a good answer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because we try to um, uh, to get uh, grasp to some material evidence and or to something just or, or to evidence. We we just uh, we we may just uh, speak about evidence and uh, uh, still there is nothing uh, nothing evident. Uh, uh, nothing so so clear to to us about antiquity because the distance, the cultural distance between us and them, uh, it's it's so huge that uh, that we so easily get lost in it. There is a um, there is a an episode, for example, related to one of these uh, pre-Socratic philosophers that fascinates me a lot. I'm talking about Empedocles uh, of uh, Acragas in Sicily. Uh, he was called a doctor and a prophet. A doctor and a prophet as, after a specific miracles, uh, a specific miracle he performed. There was this woman uh, which was considered uh, considered uh, dead for dead for uh, thirty days for almost one month, uh, and uh, he foresee that she would uh, she would uh, she would eventually resuscitate. She would eventually wake up. And the woman got back to life, and that's why that's when uh, Empedocles become uh, became a, a a doctor and a prophet for uh, for his fellow citizens in Acragas. Now, what does it mean? This is a miracle, and uh, like uh, now, let me make a reference to a to a very contemporary uh, uh, character, Alistair Crowley, <laughs> says the says that said that. Uh, Magic is whatever uh, most of the people around cannot understand. So it's manipulating uh, nature uh, in a, without any any uh, any real uh, any real secret. But uh, is uh, as as far as uh, what, who who is around you cannot understand how you are manipulating nature. Um, this is magic. And so this is what happened to Empedocles. How can we understand? Uh, how can uh, so my frustration and my interest is how we interpret miracles. I am not personally uh, a religious person, so uh, I can't interpret miracles as a, as a, as a something invisible, as a supernatural uh, presence uh, performing something. 
I have to refer back to what Alistair Crowley says. So miracles are, are like magic or something that is performed that is not supernatural, but simply people, uh, most of the people around cannot understand. So how can we try to interpret what happened to what Empedocles did and what happened to this woman? This woman probably, uh, probably, for sure we know that uh, ancient Greeks and Romans didn't know about coma. Uh, but still coma, uh, coma could, uh, could, uh, could exist. Uh, probably uh, we can only speculate, but uh, if a person was esteemed uh, to, be, to be dead and then uh, was coming back to life, um, probably it experienced a coma. How we can do this speculation? We know that there are other doctors at the same age of uh, Empedocles uh, writing treatises on the people that lived two, two times, Deuteropotmoi, they are called in ancient Greek. The people that were once alive, then were dead, and then were alive again. So we know that actually there were uh, uh, scientists and doctors who were interrogating themselves around the concept uh, of uh, around the phenomenon of coma without knowing that uh, uh, knowing it uh, in the way we, we know. And so what happened? Uh, how can we interpret this uh, miracle of Empedocles? Uh, how can we decipher it? Maybe, and this uh, a, a doctor, a friend of mine, a doctor, uh, helped, me, helped me get some, uh, some ideas about it. Maybe he, uh, he just realized that uh, after some days, without noticing any sign of the corpse decomposing, something was not uh, was not uh, was not right about this person being dead. Or maybe uh, what a doctor could have done with the means he had at the time uh, would have been to put a just put a mirror under the nose of this woman and realize that uh, even the slightest uh, uh, sign of breath was present. And so uh, to realize that at some point this person was not dead and at some point she might have, uh, she might have woken up. This is how we try to, this is the, how we can try to speculate about deciphering ancient miracles. And uh, this is why I say that uh, it's both fascinating and frustrating because it's, after all, it's speculation. We will never know. Uh, but it's uh, fascinating because uh, I strongly believe that uh, Nothing is really magical the way that uh, the way that uh, in in a way that uh, supernatural powers are involved, uh, but uh, everything can be a, a marvelous quiz to our uh, to our mind. I believe in a lot of coincidences and I believe in a lot of magic, but there is I mean not magic, but there's things that get chalked up into magic or there's weird things you can't explain. I'm not a religious guy. I'm not really a magic guy either, but there's just some things about dreams where you hear an account of things. You go, is that real? I mean, that just sounds so spot on that a decision could be made that way. You know, there's a lot of weird areas when it comes to supernatural belief, especially in our culture in general. And there's still some of that as well today. I don't toss it out. I think, you know, psychic stuff, uh, things there's, there's so much where it's like, I know you, I, when it comes to proof, it's like that person can tell you their experience, but there's been a lot of examples. And I think that's where there's a whole push to astral projection. There's a whole push to lucid dreaming more. There's a whole push to afterlife or near death experiences. There's an interest in our culture about that. Cause I think it's that side of us that has this one, a belief in something bigger or something more, whether you're religious or not, it's just something that comes after. And I think that's the same thing. I mean, when was the first medicines that were starting to be used? When did they figure out cam cam chamomile whatever it's called chamomile tea works to help sleep uh other aspects smelling salts can wake you up if you're sleeping or if you're knocked out i mean there's a lot of weird areas where you start figuring out that people are trying many different ways to try and find out how this works what is the whole concept how do i create it over and over and over again besides sleeping at a temple of a god you know there's it's it's fascinating yeah <laughs> yeah well I don't know. I, it's. Uh, I can tell you. I. I don't know. My. My honest answer is. Uh, is. Uh, is. I don't know what I. After because I for. Uh, for so long I've been. Uh, I've been studying it. Uh, I. Uh, as I told you, I. 
miracles are interesting uh, are, an in, are an interesting miracles and magic uh, are, uh, are interesting to decipher if is it po if it, if it's possible uh, but after all we are left with uh, with some uh, with some data uh, so dreaming is used uh, has been used for uh, nearly 3000 years by human cultures if there was not a real use in it then why will this happen i mean uh, culture evolves uh, culture and biology evolves uh, in a in a in a smart way uh, so if there is no use uh, now i'm trying to be i'm trying to to speak about the use of uh, dreaming without uh, uh, from a from an atheist point of view such uh, like like it's uh, like it's mine well we have data that shows that psychedelics can explore that alternate consciousness or reality and i think that's what's interesting is dreams can kind of be the same way just without a tool to be able to do so or a drug like this whole understanding in academia with consciousness we don't have an answer for what consciousness is it's still this baffling mystery today there's ideas about it but if you wanted a, a definitive answer on what consciousness is and i'm just like man we've had this long history of trying to understand ourselves for the long like we can decipher this is that like this is my like you know this cells make up this table and cells make up all of everything around us but then when it comes to understanding our consciousness you know what is that made up of you're like brain tissue but it's like what else is that consciousness creativity aspect i don't know it's a constant like snake biting its own tail of trying to like, much trying to understand death it's like trying to understand who you are as a species or what you are as a species yeah, yeah, and for that, I mean, uh, to talk about consciousness, I'm just a poor archaeologist, so my my speculation cannot go that far. But um, but yeah, I mean, uh, for sure, it's uh, uh, dreams are, a, are an amazing uh, can be might be an amazing tool to 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 explore. However, about consciousness, uh, it's one of these uh, big questions that make me think that makes me think. Uh, Probably is one of these questions that uh, will never get an answer, but it's just good to keep uh, to keep uh, trying uh, to keep to to keep us uh, struggle struggling with it. Uh, but I don't know if it's useful to find a real answer for uh, for. Uh, I mean, what what do we do with the answer? What is the consciousness? Probably help us sleep better and dream more. I don't know. Um, <laughs> when, it, when it comes to dreams and rituals, I mean, do you think that rituals have benefited dreaming? Do you think it's really just setting? It's like it's like uh, there's a rule out there for taking psychedelics, which is set and setting. Like make sure that you're in the right place to take LSD or take something like that so you don't freak out and have a bad trip. It's like making your environment or climate around you good. So you have a good situation when you do take this altered state. And I think rituals probably had a benefit in people's dreams. I mean, if you do a bunch of things like fasting, if you do a bunch of things like eating a certain diet or anything, cleaning yourself out in a sense, doing what someone just tells you to do, and then you go and sleep in a temple or a chamber, you're probably going to have some pretty insane dreams. Yeah, again, again, uh, you're asking a, a very interesting question, and uh, but it goes uh, far beyond my speculate with me. Speculate. My, yeah, let's speculate about it. So yeah, you said it. You said it in your uh, in your question. Setting is the is the is the real uh, is what it's important. We hear we hear a lot about how setting it's important to, uh, and we 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 hear and we read in. Uh, Psycho in uh, psychology uh, publications about how the use, for example, of uh, psychedelics uh, is important uh, and is determined by the setting for therapeutic use. And if we refer back to uh, the ritual aspect, the ritualistic aspect of uh, of dreaming, the ritual, the ritual, but not the religious, because uh, for the for what concerns the religious, as I told you. Uh, both my personal uh, uh, my personal attitude and the distance that we have with the phenomenon that uh, with the phenomena that I study um, makes it uh, make, makes it difficult to to evaluate to what degree and what was religious. But ritual understood as a set of techniques that means also taking really uh, great care of the setting of the order 
of the actions you undertake before dreaming of the substances that might help you. Like, for example, in some cases, in some instances, psychedelics or uh, kind of substances close to psychedelics in some rituals, in some ancient rituals, might have been involved. Uh, anyway, the order, so the rituals, that means the techniques, uh, the order that, uh, that you, you perform these actions uh, and the people that uh, the, the community aspect is really important. The fact that you were not alone, the fact that uh, uh, all of these aspects, all of these uh, rituals involved a community were performed. I use often the word performed because they are not something that you do alone. You do in front of other people, for other people, not only for you. Uh, be, be the people real uh, persons or invisible persons, like the gods. Anyway, all of these things were, were set in a way that finally the, the dream would uh, give you a chance to, uh, to find, at least at the very least, to discover something about you that you didn't know. Do you think, I mean, we're not just talking about time periods here, but if we talk about the influence of just cultures and different areas of the world, do you think dreams really structured a lot of that in the beginning and there's still kind of remnants of that as well today? <laughs> nice. I don't know. I really don't know. That's what, I, I mean, mean, how much? It structured us today. I feel like in today, at least in the States and society over here, there's a lot of people that like dreams, but I just look at the, how do you explain a lot of the amazing innovations people just woke up and started to be able to create? I mean, I think a lot more cultures have different ideas of what dreams can lead to, but I'm curious to see if it structured any. To structure a culture through dream, that's a, that's a, that's a, a brave uh... A brave, uh, a brave shot. Maybe, maybe. I mean, then, then we to really we we would need a time machine to travel back to to prehistory. We know that, uh, yeah, we, dreams were uh, were so were such a, a shared treat that I don't know if it's uh, if it's too much to say that they structured the cultures, but they to say that dreams had had an impact on history. It's fair enough that many, several dreams had an impact on history is uh, fair enough. Let's make an example. I mean, uh, uh, dreams and visions, dreams and visions, uh, Christianity. Christianity, we can say that, uh, I mean, this uh, unfortunately or fortunately anyway, and for more, more, uh, more unfortunately than fortunately, had a huge impact on, uh, on history. Uh, how it starts? When, when, uh, Christianity becomes uh, a religious movement uh, that spread all over the ancient Mediterranean. It starts from a vision. And the vision is that of the disciples of Jesus um, seeing the empty uh, grave. From this point, the, from, from this vision that can, be as, uh, that can be understood as a dream, that is a waking vision, a waking vision, but for the ancients there were no, no real difference between a dream and the waking vision. Um, what was the life of a guy, the poor Jesus, I don't think that he, that he intended to, to become the, the chief of, a, of, a, of, a, of such a, of such a de depraved institution like the churches, uh, uh, the churches today. Uh, what was a, a, a small Hebrew, movement uh, that just aimed at uh, at reforming uh, at reforming uh, not even religion but you know communities in palestine uh, became a religious movement from the moment that uh, some of the disciples had this vision we we and it's not even it's not even uh, important for us to to know if uh, they had it for real or or not what is important is that they used this paradigm of the of the vision of the dream of the empty grave of Christ as a proof that he was resurrected, and this was the starting moment of uh, of the of Christianity. So well, this is definitely a vision that impact that had, that had an impact on history. Still impacts history today too. Still, still too much.
But, <laughs> if I can, if I can <laughs> add a personal comment, that's it. Uh, Luigi, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show, man. Um, is there a place where people can find your work? Um, any links that you have at Twitter? Yeah, thanks. So my some of my some of my work is uh, is available on uh, Academia. Just typing my name and surname, Luigi Lafasciano. And uh, uh, the part a part of my work that I really care a lot and is not necessarily connected to dreams. It's not uh, connected to my academic research. It is, but goes beyond that. Is with my fellow companions of the Diachron Institute, an organization that I co-founded and I direct uh, since 2015. And uh, you can learn about our uh, uh, educational project. Uh, uh, educational projects we we deal with multisensory uh, and experiential education, and we try. Uh, we are a bunch of different professionals. From we are archaeologists, uh, uh, ecologists, architects, uh, psychologists, um, uh, philologists, and uh, and other people from uh, all over the world. We try to create uh, educational projects to make some relevant themes like for example for example the relationship between nature and culture available to as ma as many people as possible and uh, outside an academic uh, and uh, theoretical frame and uh, we you can check our work at uh, on our website it is uh, www.diacron.org I'm going to link all your links in the description. Luigi, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, man. Thank you so much for doing the show. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.